Man, it is good to see you all. Feel free to go ahead and grab a seat. Thank you, Buck. They're going to cut the lights back on so I can see your beautiful faces. Buck is doing wind sprints right now for the sake of lighting. I absolutely love it. Um, if I uh, haven't had the chance to meet you, my name is, uh, is Michael. I get the privilege of serving as the pastor here, and I'm also the backup to the backup to the backup drummer. So that was kind of uh, my morning right now. And uh, that being said, uh, if you, <laughs> you're going to cheer for that. <laughs> if you notice people that are not musical are the ones that are cheering right now. That's kind of how that works. Uh, now, for real, if you, uh, if you know somebody that uh, is musically inclined and is gifted on the drums, we are looking for people that can play that. If you know uh, an uncle or a nephew, we would love to meet them. Uh, let us know. That would be a, a big help to uh, our church family. Today is part three of our series, The Apocalypse. Uh, we are going through the book of Revelation, which is always such a sensational book. And, and when I say sensational, I mean that it, it kind of grips you with these really lofty ideas or these things that you think may or may not happen in the future. There's all sorts of people that debate about it, ask questions about it. And the goal of this series is to make the book of Revelation, extremely practical. Extremely practical. I've been talking with some of you uh, throughout the past day or two, uh, or I guess two weeks actually, and um, it's been really interesting to see how uh, very rarely is the book of Revelation taught in such a way where it helps you live your life today. Um, and so to kind of catch up to speed on uh, what we're doing in this series, week one was the introduction to it. And then last week, I kind of laid the overall structure that there are seven letters written to seven different churches. Chapter two and chapter three of the book of Revelation include seven separate letters, each one written to their church. And if we have uh, that map, I don't know if we can toss that up here. This will kind of help you guys understand um, how the entire thing works. And so the one we talked about last week was the church of Ephesus which is one of the most famous churches that has ever existed. And that church was the one that planted these six other churches. And so we're going to kind of start at Ephesus and go clockwise all around. Uh, so today we're going to hit on the church of Smyrna, which is a church that had uh, some great things going on in it. And Jesus gives some phenomenal encouragement to it. And the second church for today is going to be the church of Pergamos, and that church, or your Bible might say Pergamum, that church is the second one we're going to talk about today. And that one's really unique because the physical dwelling spot of Satan is located at that church. And so we're going to hit on that a little bit today. Um, the next church, the fourth church, is the church of Thyatira. And we have the church of Sardis, the church of Philadelphia. And then the final church will be the church of Laodicea. And these are seven letters that are written to seven specific churches. And within the seven letters and within the seven churches, there are each one of the letters and they have seven different parts to them. You're catching this theme of the number seven. And so that the seven things are, every single one of these is going to start off with an address. It's going to title the letter to somebody, one of those seven churches. It's going to title the, uh, the letter to them. And then there's going to be an attribute of Jesus that's mentioned as the second thing. After that is approval, he's going to talk about what he appreciates about the church. There's goodness found in pretty much every church. Then there is an accusation. All seven of these churches have something that's wrong with it. And Jesus calls it out. If you were with us last week, you know that the church of Ephesus had everything going from them on the exterior, but internally they had lost their passion for Jesus, that their first love, their heart for God was no longer there. Um, that was the accusation to the church of Ephesus. We're going to talk about the accusation for the other two churches. Um, but Jesus doesn't just give accusation. He also gives advice, which is the fifth thing. And then he appeals to them on what they should do. And finally, there is assurance that he gives. So seven different parts of it. And we're going to look at those seven different layers to two of the churches this morning. Are you with me and ready to go? All right, so what I want to do is I want to pray through this real quick. I want to pray that God would use the warnings of these two churches we're going to hit on today and that it would spur us on to live our life the way that Jesus wants us to. 
The book of Revelation is not supposed to be a predict the end of the world. It's supposed to be a wake-up call to believers to say, let's get our life right. And so I want to pray that the Holy Spirit would just do what the Holy Spirit does. Would you join me in praying over this? God, I pray that this text would be, number one, taught accurately, but that you would also give us the ears to hear, as it is literally mentioned in these verses. Um, God, spur us on to live lives that are worthy of the calling you have for us. And I ask this in the name of Jesus. Amen. First church is the church of Smyrna. Say to your neighbor, Smyrna. What a fun word right there. We could have named our church that. Like when we were praying about what the name of our church would have been, that could have been it, although it wouldn't make much sense because we don't live in Smyrna, but they did. So Revelation 2, verses 8 through 11, is the spot where Jesus writes to this church. So in verse 8 of Revelation chapter 2, it says, And to the angel of the church in Smyrna, write the words of the first and the last, who died and came to life. I know you have tribulation and your poverty, but you are rich, and the slander of those who say that they are Jews and are not, but are a synagogue of Satan. Do not fear what you are about to suffer. Behold, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison that you may be tested. For And for 10 days you will have tribulation. Be faithful unto death, and I will give you the crown of life. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the church. The one who conquers will not be hurt by the second death. So let's, let's outline this briefly, because we have these seven different parts, and then we're going to pull the application out of this. Revelation 2, verse 8a, so the first half of ver- verse 8a, uh, Eight says, into the, uh, into the angel of the church of Smyrna. So that's the, that's the address of it. The first thing is the address. It's writing to this specific church. It would have been like if they said, we're writing to the church of the rise, or we're writing to the church of some other church that's down the street. It's specifically addressed to them. And then in the second half of verse 8 is the attribute. It says, the words of the first and last who died and came to life. Who's the one who died and came to life? His name is Jesus. So again, it's, it's referencing Jesus, but not literally with his name, but an attribute that this church would have needed to know. And every single one of these letters is like this. It refers to a characteristic or an attribute of Jesus to help identify that he is the one who wrote the letter. So we have the address, we have the attribute, and in verse 9, he approves the church. He says, I know your tribulation and your poverty, but you are rich. And the slander of those who say that they are Jews and are not, but are a synagogue of Satan. This particular congregation has had tremendous persecution, and we're going to hit on that. And they've stayed faithful during that. And many of them are, are poor right now. And it says, although you're rich, because materialistically, this church is not doing very well. They're, they're a very, very poor church. But when it comes to spiritual riches, they are very, very rich. Because they are a church that's withstanding persecution, that's withstanding tribulation. So they are poor in the monetary sense, but they are very, very rich in the spiritual sense. And if we're looking at our lives, it's not that wealth is bad by any means, but if I could pick one of the two, I'm going to choose spiritual riches over material riches every single day. Because you know that you cannot bring your material riches with you, right? All of these things are going to have a time where they expire here on earth. It's the spiritual riches that you are able to bring with yourself. And then he gives the accusation. And the accusation is interesting for this particular church. Would you throw that map up one more time? So I told you that there was the, uh, the church where Satan literally uh, was located. That would be the church of Pergamos or Pergamum. And if you kind of take that, 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 that spot right there and you go further out, you're going to see that the church of Thyatira and Sardis are churches that have a lot of internal issues. You're going to see the church of Ephesus and Laodicea are the ones that have more of their external stuff going on, but their internal, their heart for Jesus is struggling. The church of Philadelphia and the church of Smyrna are churches that actually are doing very, very well in all senses spiritually. So the accusation to this first church this morning is much different than the accusation you're going to see in the second church. The accusation is this, do not 
fear, according to Revelation 2.10. Do not fear what you are about to suffer. Behold, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison that you may be tested. So that's the accusation. Don't fear. Stuff is coming your way. The advice that he gives is, and for 10 days you will have tribulation. Be faithful unto death, and I will give you the crown of life. His appeal is, he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the church. And the final uh, assurance is, the one who conquers will not be hurt by the second death. So this church, if you could label it something other than just the name of Smyrna, this is the persecuted church. That's their biggest issue, is that they're, they're coming after them in persecution. And persecution is very, very different depending on where you live and in what generation you live and in what part of the world and the time frame. Persecution looks very, very different depending on where you are. The persecution that this church is facing is very different than the persecution we're facing in America. Not many of us are being threatened to spend time in prison and potentially die for our faith like they were in Smyrna, like they were in many, many other areas throughout the globe even today. Persecution can look different. But can we acknowledge that our country at one point was more closely aligned with Christian values than it is today? Our country is so much different than it was you know, I'd say five years ago, 10 years ago, but if we especially went back 100 years ago, totally different. You would find the Ten Commandments in all sorts of different places. But now, those very commandments have been banned from the courthouse. And there have been certain states where they have physically removed those because it's not in accordance to our law and our freedom to have those present. At one point, we based ourselves on that. Now it is very, very different. At one point, there was prayer in school. How many of you all had prayer in school? Any of you guys? So we have some of you on here remember what prayer was like in school, but there is now an, an entire different generation that even has kids now where prayer was not a part of school. I can remember zero times of a teacher ever leading me in prayer. It just shows how, how different uh, our experiences can be in our country and how much things have shifted within just a generation or two. The biblical view of marriage and gender has been radically challenged in our society. It wasn't that way at one point. It is that way now. And, and I'm not saying this to beat up the red, white, and blue. I love our country. I love our country. I am so thankful for the men and women that have sacrificed themselves so that we can be free in this country. But what I know is that my hope is not found in the right, red, white, and blue. My hope is found in Jesus. And that as much as I love our country, if you look at the book of Revelation, you're not going to find the United States in the book of Revelation. Now, does that mean that the U.S. Will be gone by then? Maybe yes, maybe no. Does it mean the U.S. will be here? Maybe yes, maybe no. But what it does tell me is that there are some things that transcend our Western American idea of what faith should look like. And we have persecution that is present in our current society. And I would say that within the last three years or so, we have changed from a country that doesn't just embrace Judeo-Christian values, but to a country that now has radical opposition to those values, which is a, a pretty big dynamic shift that's taking place. Uh, there have been teachers that have been suspended for not referring to children by whatever pronoun they think they should have. If you were to look at our society a couple years ago, that would have never, ever taken place. We, we are at the point in our country where things are shifting radically, and I believe there will come a day where we are even more so persecuted for our beliefs. I wish that wasn't the, the, the case. I pray and I hope that Lord Jesus comes and does something within our country. I'm not saying have a Republican swing or a Democratic swing. I'm just saying I want Jesus to come and do something in our country, which is a big deal. But until that happens, and if that doesn't happen, how do we survive in this current society that we're in that is very, very much against traditional biblical values? And that's the question that is found in this particular church is that they are church, they are a church that's being persecuted, but they're withstanding that. 
And while we are not the church of Smyrna, we are the church that is trending in that direction because of our society. And so here's the answer to that question when persecution comes. According to Jesus, who I think is a great person to take advice from, he says this in the second half of verse 10. And he says, and for 10 days you will have tribulation. The response is be faithful. The response to that is to have people that are willing to be faithful in whatever season they're in. So when your children test your patience, how many of you all, your kids have tested your patience? Come on, I'm seeing people in here that are raising their hands for their adult kids, all right? Like like, like kids and family will test your patience. You know what you don't do? You don't take your three-year-old and like kick him out. Like, you don't do that. You recognize that when you are assigned to a parental role, you stay what? You stay faithful to that. Hit on marriage for a second. Marriage has difficulties and trials. When those trials come, what do you do? You stay faithful faithful to that. When you're at work and there are tests that come your way and you are beyond stressed out when it comes to that, what are you supposed to do when the trial comes your way? You should stay faithful. When your faith is being tested, when society is telling you to think one way, but your Bible tells you to think a different way, you should be thinking accordance to your faith in a way that is faithful to what the word of God says. Now, I know there are tests in this life that make you question whether or not you are on the right path. There may be tests that you're having in work right now, and it's causing you to question whether or not you should stay faithful to that particular organization. And there are days where you have to cut off the job dynamic. There are days when you have to cut off. I I, I understand that. I'm not asking anybody to continue in a way that's harmful to them, but that should be the exception rather than the rule. The rule should be overall the blanket statement is that we are called to be people that are faithful. And that should be your default response to things. And honestly, there's so many people that lack the unction and the ability to stay faithful in difficult circumstances. Can I tell you this? You cannot stay faithful unless you've been tested. Because if you're just going along with whatever feels good and sounds right in your own mind, you're not actually being faithful to something other than yourself. And that's being really, really selfish right there when the Bible tells us to deny ourselves and to embrace who Christ is as he set the example for us. You cannot be faithful until you are tested. And just because you are being tested does not mean that God is leading you another direction. Because it's in some of those moments where you're, you're tested the most and you stay faithful in those moments that God brings the greatest growth into your life. And that's what this church is experiencing right here. Persecution and trials are a good sign. I'm going to say that again. It goes against our flesh. But persecution and trials are a good sign in your life. If life is just easy and no one has any opposition against you, you're probably not taking ground for anything. You should be encouraged by the trials that you Face. That's why James 1 says this in verse 2 through 3. It says, count it all what? Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds. For you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. So, so here's what we should do. We should do what I would call the faith flip. That when you have a a family dynamic or a work dynamic that is not what you wish it would be and there is a trial going on, that rather than getting so frustrated at that and getting so mad about that and getting ready to quit on that and throw in the towel, flip it and go, okay, there's a reason why this is happening. It's the testing of my faith and God is going to bring something good out of this. I wish we had people that would lean into the faithfulness that was modeled by Jesus Christ. Aren't you glad that Jesus didn't go part way? Aren't you glad that he didn't just go all the way up to the garden and then go, Father, if you would take this cup, you know what? Go ahead and take it. It would be awful. Everything would be different. I'm so glad that we have a faithful king and that we can follow in his footsteps. And so you're probably thinking, well, Michael, this is, 
little stuff you're talking about. When it comes to the, the important things, that's what I stay faithful to. Now hold on, because the book of Luke says this. One who is faithful with what? Very little is also faithful in much. And the one who is dishonest in a very little is also dishonest in much. We need to be people that are faithful in every single corner of our life. It is a attribute. It is a calling that our world wants to eliminate and just hop from pleasure to pleasure to pleasure to pleasure, essentially hedonism, when we are called to be Christ-centered, faithful people. That's what this church experiences in persecution. So when you experience persecution, teachers, stay faithful. Stay faithful. So that's the first church for today. The second church is the church of Pergamum. And this is the church that I would say connects with the American church extremely well. This is the lenient church. Look at verse 12 through 17. And to the angel of the church in Pergamum, write the word of him who has the sharp two-edged sword. I know where you dwell, where Satan's throne is. Yet you hold fast my name, and you did not deny my faith even in the days of Antipas, my faithful witness, who was killed among you where Satan dwells. Satan is such an interesting creature. He is not a creator. He is a creature, which means that Satan is not omnipresent. God is omnipresent, meaning that he is present in all places at once. Satan is not omnipresent. God is all-knowing. Satan is not all-knowing. There's a big difference between the creator and a creation. And Satan does not have the same abilities that God does. He is confined to a singular physical location. He can travel anywhere within the globe that he wants to. He can ascend up to heaven. He, he, he can come back down. He has room to be able to roam, but he is only able to be in one place at one time. And during this time frame right here, according to verse 13, we know that at the church of Pergamum in that area, that is where Satan literally was, that he would dwell there as the end of that verse says. He actually had a throne that was present. He would sit up on that throne because he loves high places, just like when he took Jesus up to a high place to show him everything. There was black smoke that came out of him. They actually took this throne, and I believe they moved it to Berlin. Don't quote me on that, but I think they did. And it's there now. You could actually go see what Satan's throne is like. I don't know where Satan is right now, but we do know where he was then. And so Satan is present in that moment, and he... Uh, Jesus says to them, I, I know where you dwell, where Satan's throne is, yet you hold fast to my name, which is pretty remarkable. With Satan literally being around the corner, they were unashamed of his name. Verse 14, but I have a few things against you. And I'm sure, like a pit in their stomach, they, there's, oh, like I wonder what this is going to be. And he says, you have some there who hold to the teaching of Balaam who taught Balak to put a stumbling block before the sons of Israel so that they might eat food sacrificed to idols and practice sexual morality. So also, I have some of you who hold the teaching of the Nicolaeans. Therefore, repent. If not, I will come to you soon and war against them with a sword of my mouth. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the church. The one who conquers, I will give some of the hidden manna, and I will give him a white stone with a new name written on the stone that no one knows except the one who receives it. So again, this church has a, a seven-fold address, this third of the seven churches, and there's seven parts of it. The address, it's to the church of Pergamum in Revelation 2.12. The second half of it is the attribute, Jesus. He is the one who has the sharp, two-edged sword, referencing his ability to take 
down people. He gives the approval in verse 13 that I told you about that he, they are willing to hold fast to his name. And then in verse 14 and 15, he gives them the accusation that they are holding to false teaching. There, there, there's Balaam that is present right there, and, and he has teachings that are incorrect. There are the Nicolaeans that have teachings that are incorrect, and they're all getting intertwined within the local church, and people have thoughts about who Jesus is, but then also have incorrect thoughts on how to practice that faith in real time. There's the advice where he says, repent. There's the appeal and the assurance, which is very similar to what it was in the previous two letters. This church is a church that is unashamed of standing up for the gospel, and that should be admired. This is a church that is willing to say Jesus is king, which is great because there are some out there that are not willing to acknowledge Jesus is king. But if you took a survey of mainline denominations, which I am totally for mainline denominations, I think the accountability system is wonderful, which is why we belong to a mainline denomination where people watch over us to make sure that we are operating correctly. I am for that. And if you look at mainline denominations uh, as an overview, you would see that the majority of them, if not all of them, say Christ is king, which is beautiful. I love that. That's actually really, really important. But here's where the issue comes. Are all Christians Christians? I would say no. Because the Bible says there's many that called on his name and did miracles in his names, and he says, yet I know you not. There are many people that classify themselves underneath the title of Christian but have a lifestyle and a relationship with Jesus that are completely contradictory to what it should be. There are people that are out there that say Jesus is king, just like the devil says Jesus is king, but are not actually followers of Christ. They are simply cultural Christians. And I commend them for being on the right path, if you will, but we also need to draw a line in the sand and say there are certain things that are required of believers that are different than the general population. There should be a difference in how our lives are lived. This was a very, very popular message to be preached back in the 30s, 40s, and 50s. And for some reason, the church has lost its backbone and won't call a spade a spade and be willing to call what truth actually is. And it doesn't matter how many haters come from that. There are things in the scriptures that are wrong, and there are ideas in this world that are wrong. We are not all the same. There are some who call on Jesus and do not actually know who he is. If you looked at the book of Numbers, you would see that there is Balaam who was there, and essentially what he did is he gathered a whole bunch of people, found a worship service that was going on. He hired a bunch of ladies to go into that worship service and to seduce all of the men that were present there. And I'm sure at first it was like a, oh, I can't believe that's happening. Kick them all out, cause a big scene, and then that happens a second week in a row, and you go, oh, they're back again. And then you go three, four, five weeks, and all of a sudden, there are things that are clearly inappropriate going on in God's house. In this church here in Pergamum, that's exactly what's happening. When you look at, at Balaam, when you look at the Nicolaeans, they had this false doctrine that was infiltrating the church. They were tolerating sin. And sin is not something to be tolerated. If you're familiar with the, the pendulum theory. The pendulum theory is quite simple, that something is going to stay at rest until an opposing force hits it. And then it will go in motion until it hits an opposing force again, and that will cause it to go back and forth. So the force is gravity. It causes it to go back and forth. And if you were to go back in church history, you would see there was a group of people that were borderline legalistic on things. Girls, you can't show your ankles in church. Men, you must make sure you have a suit and tie. Drums are definitely not allowed in church. There cannot be any sort of music that has rhythm to it. And all of these different things that are present, and people said, hold on, those things aren't actually in the Bible. Let's reconsider things. And so the swing happens this way to a grace-filled movement, and the grace of God is very, very real. But what they do is they throw every single sinful idea, and they cover it underneath grace to where I can do anything I want because of the grace of God. 
that, that, that I, I can live however I want and God's just going to take care of it. He's the one who's going to clean up the mess in the end. And I think we've reached a point to where people are abusing the grace of God. Paul even talked about that in one of his letters. Should we continue to sin so the grace may abound? Absolutely not. Paul says, you've got to stop this. And somewhere in the middle, we find this balance. And there's a time coming when believers need to grow up in their faith. It says in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 11, it says, When I was a child, I spoke like a child. I thought like a child. I responded like a child. And, and there's nothing wrong with children. I love kids. Kids are absolutely amazing. That's why our church is packed with kids. But, but what happens now is we have all of these adults who come into the service and you got your, your binky with you and your boppy with you and your little bottle and you're doing your, your cute little church thing acting like a baby Christian. If some of the, the men and women walked up to me with a bottle in their hand and a blankie and their bunny into service, I'd say something's wrong with you. Like you need some counseling. It has nothing to do with Jesus. You just need to grow up. And the same is true in our spiritual life, that we cannot keep behaving like children of our faith. Yes, there's childlike faith. It's a beautiful thing. But there comes a time, according to verse 11, when I became a man, I gave up childish ways. There needs to be believers who are willing to give up the childish things that once held them in captivity and embrace being a full, mature, self-feeding Christian who understands the word of God and allows it to be able to occupy and guide their life. Proverbs 14 says, there is a way that seems right to man, but its end is the way to death. And as I, as I read this, there are parts of my life where I go, I've been minimizing that. I, I've been a little bit childish in that way. That there are some things that, that, that I, I got to get out of my life. And please understand, new believers, so glad you're new, new in your faith. Come on, that's great. Enjoy being spoon-fed for right now and praise God for it. I'm not going to take one of my, my newborn kids and just feed them a, a, a steak because that would be inappropriate for them. And there's some believers that are new to your faith and now's not the time for you to fully dive into all of this. But there are others where you need to now do this. And this is what Jesus' advice is to the believer that is caught in habitual sin. This is Jesus' advice to the person who has listened to false teachings that are against what the scripture says. Jesus doesn't give a 47-step plan. Jesus does not say, well, we'll work it out in the end. It's going to be okay. Jesus gives a very, very, very strong warning. Revelation 2, verse 16 says this, Therefore, repent. In our country, there needs to be a great repentance that is done from believers. We should not expect ungodly people to behave in godly ways. We expect ungodly people to behave in ungodly ways. But for people that call themselves sons and daughters of the king, sons and daughters of God, we should behave like sons and daughters of the God. And if there's things that are incorrect, we need to ask the Lord for forgiveness, and to turn away from that particular action. And, and this is where, where some of the fear kind of crept in. This is not bad fear. This is holy fear that's present. This is what Jesus says after that. He says, if not, I will come to you soon and war against them. Basically, he says, here's your chance to take care of your junk, and if you don't take care of it, I'm going to do it. And if you have kids that trash their rooms... Why do kids do that? Like, they're like, all right, here's a drawer. Let's just dump it out right now. Why? So I can find everything. I don't know why they do that. So what I'll do with my kids is when they, they've trashed everything, I say, okay, you have a moment to come pick it up, and you can go pick it up. But if they don't pick it up, guess who ends up going in? I'd like to say me. Honestly, Erica does a better job of this. Um, but when she goes in or I go in, there's things that they love that go in the trash can. Not because we don't love them, but because gross. 
Like there's some things you got to stop that. When dad comes in, it's not the process they wanted, but I'll tell you what, it gets the job done. Some of us got some messy rooms and we're just looking at it, dancing around it, like crawling over it to go to bed. I don't know how kids do that. Gross, gross, gross. There's going to come a time when the father is going to come in and he is going to set things straight. And I can tell you, when dad comes in with his strong fist, there is a fear and there is some difficulty for the person that's receiving it. He says, I will come to you soon and war against them with the sword of my mouth. That's the warning to that church is to straighten things up. Now, I'm going to ask the the worship team to come on back up. And the ending of this particular letter, I find to be very, very fascinating. In the final verse to the letter of the church of Pergamum, it says this in the 17th verse. It says, to the one who conquers, conquers what? Conquers all of the false teachings. To the one who conquers that, this is what will take place. I will give some of the hidden manna and I will give him a white stone and a new name written on the stone that no one knows except the one who receives it. Now, us sitting here in 2022, the idea of you receiving a white stone with a random name on it is probably not the thing that sounds the most exciting. Like we probably want something more for our faith than just getting a rock from Jesus. Well, understand, in that culture, there were Roman games that would take place. And if you were in, a, in, in some sort of game or some sort of sporting event, and you trained and you trained and you trained, and you said no to Roman pizza, I don't know if they had Roman pizza, I want to believe they did, and you said yes to Roman veggies, I'm sure they had that. You said no to sitting down and watching animals walk by rather than TV right now. I don't know all the choices they made, but they, they denied themselves of things so that they could train themselves for the games. And the games would go on and they, they would win the first place or the second place or the third place. They would stand up on the podium. There was a grand celebration. And what they would do to the people that were victorious is they would hand them something that had two particular uses. Guess what they would hand these people? A white rock. They would take this rock and they would hand it to them. And number one, it meant they were victorious. I'm sure they went to their friends and were like, look at my rock. And they were like, I found the same rock on the floor. It's not that special. But this is what's different about the rock that they received versus the rocks that you would find on the floor. They would have an inscription that was placed on that rock. And when they were given that rock, that inscription that was present on the rock became a ticket to the after party or to the celebration dinner. And not everybody could go to that particular event. Only those who possessed the white rock with the name that was carved into it. So there are some that are going to live their life in such a way to where they do not have the white rock. Their day is going to come where they stand before Jesus. He's going to say, I, I never knew you. You have no, no, no proof that you knew me. There's going to be others that have the rock. And that becomes their entry ticket to the marriage supper of the Lamb that we're going to read about at the end of the book of Revelation. The very church where Satan dwelled just outside is the church that sets the example for turning away from false teaching and turning towards solid teaching and a solid lifestyle that allows them to have the gift of everlasting life. When we wrap up services here, if you've been here for a while, you know the rhythm. We ask people to raise their hand. And I think that's a big deal. When you engage yourself physically, it helps tie things together mentally and spiritually. And they pray this prayer they acknowledge that Jesus is Lord with their lips. And they believe in their heart that God raised him from the dead. And according to the book of Romans, it says they are now saved, which is beautiful news. But did you know that in the early church, that wasn't a part of how they did church? 
They did not have times where people raised their hand and came down to the front and they prayed the sinner's prayer. That's not found in the Bible. I think it's a great tool, but it's not found in the Bible. What is, is people that repent of their own lifestyle and lean into what Jesus has called them to do. So if you would stand to your feet, I want you to do an inventory right now of these two accusations that were made to these two churches in the book of Revelation. Number one, check your faithfulness. Are you doing this because it's convenient? Or are you doing it out of principle that you are a faithful person? Apply that to your faith, to your kids, to your work, to your marriage, all of these things. Check your faithfulness. And for some of you, you're going, "Mm, I've cheated a little bit there. Cheating has great temporary results, but it never lasts. How is your faithfulness doing? And where does faithfulness come from? It comes from your faith. Faith in Jesus produces faithfulness. Trust in Jesus produces being trustworthy. How is your faithfulness? And the second thing is, are there false doctrines that you have embraced? Or are there things that you are not turning from when the Lord has clearly told you to stop those things? The book of Revelation is not meant to be super sensational. It's meant to be aggressively practical to believers. This message is for believers in the church, not for the unchurched. And so God, I pray this morning that we would willingly take inventory of our life for the person that needs to be more faithful. I pray in Jesus' name, God, that their faith in you would produce that kind of fruit. For the person that needs to, according to the book of Revelation, chapter 2, verse 16, therefore repent. God, I pray they would turn from their past and turn towards you they would become that new creation that the book of 2 Corinthians tells us about. And I ask all of this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Would you worship with us?